During the events of World War II, Juan Pujol Garcia, Agent Garbo, was at the forefront of deception and espionage for the Allied powers. Inspired by his hatred for the National Socialists, or Nazis, and everything they stood for, Agent Garbo became a double agent for Britain and led a campaign of deception and false information, coming to a climax in his critical role in coercing German troops away from the beaches of Normandy in anticipation of the Allied invasion on D-Day. Agent Garbo, the spy who saved D-Day Juan Pujol Garcia was born on February 14, 1912, to a conservative Catholic mother and a socially liberal father in Barcelona, Spain. Pujol's political beliefs were instilled in him early in his childhood as, like his father, Pujol began to take on a heavily anti-war, apolitical sentiment. In particular, Pujol disliked the idea of political extremism, that people were willing to fight and die over disagreeing opinions. This sentiment was going to be a challenge in 1936 when the Spanish Civil War broke out between the Socialist Republic and the Fascist Nationalists. Pujol's life was torn as he was taken away from his small poultry farm and conscripted into the Socialist Republic Army for his six months of compulsory military service. Pujol despised the Republic and found their beliefs and practices to be destructive and cruel. So during a minor battle, Pujol defected to the Nationalist side in hopes for a better life for himself and his family. Instead, Pujol found that he despised the views of the fascist nationalists equally or even more so than those of the socialist republicans. The nationalists entered Madrid on March 28, 1939, officially ending the civil war. But for Pujol, an even greater threat was rising in Europe. I yearn for justice. From the medley of tangled ideas and fantasies going round and round in my head, a plan slowly began to take shape. I must do something, something practical. I must make my contribution to the good of humanity. The end of the Spanish Civil War, paired with the rise of Adolf Hitler in Germany in 1939, left Garcia with a bitter disdain for both fascism and communism, and by extension, Nazi Germany. Pujol decided that he would make his mark on the war spying for the British, viewing them as a bastion of the values that he believed in. However, Pujol would go on to contact the British Embassy in Madrid three times without success. Offering no experience or connections, the British simply could not see what a former poultry farmer could do for them in terms of espionage. Frustrated, Pujol decided that if he could not help the British, he would instead attempt to hinder the advances of the Nazis. Pujol created a fake backstory in which he was a pro-Nazi politician in Spain who was preparing to travel to London on a diplomatic mission. The Germans, desperate for any intel on Britain, arranged for Pujol to meet with one of their agents to be vetted and eventually trained in the ways of German espionage. Once verified, Pujol was provided a basic spy kit, including money, invisible ink, and a German codebook. Pujol's mission, described by his British case officer Tomas Harris, was as follows. In England, he would see as much information as possible and try to recruit sub-agents whom he could leave behind when he had to return. He was given cover addresses and money, and a warning that he should be careful not to underestimate the British, as they were a formidable enemy. Instead of traveling to London as instructed by his German case officers, Pujol traveled to Lisbon and established his makeshift base of operations at the Lisbon Public Library. Pujol went on to purchase an assortment of British newspapers and borrow travel guides about London. Using this information, Pujol built his credibility with German intelligence by sending letters of his fictitious day-to-day -day life in London. Pujol spun an elaborate network of fake spies relaying to German intelligence information about them, including fake names, personalities, and motivations for supporting the Nazi cause. His reports were widely believed credible by German intelligence, who created a dossier entailing all of his fictitious sub-agents. Pujol then began using this to feed German intelligence fake intel about troop movements in Europe. Pujol's network of fake sub-agents turned out to be a masterstroke for two reasons. Firstly, Pujol's reports were so believable that the British intelligence who intercepted his messages began a manhunt in London searching for his fake persona. In addition, on his end, if the Nazis discovered any false information he passed along, he simply needed to blame it on one of his fake agents. Pujol, remaining in Lisbon, made contact with the American outpost there and explained his situation to the officers. Pujol was referred to the British and quickly admitted into the MI6 spy program, where he met his case handler, Tomas Harris. In April of 1942, Pujol and his family were moved to London, where he was officially named a double agent and given the codename Garbo after Spanish actress Greta Garbo due to the outstanding acting skills he had displayed up to that point. Garbo's tactical misdirection earned him the trust of the Nazi High Command, which then opted to begin radio transmission with him rather than sending messages by plane, 
for a more secure and immediate transfer of information. As such, they sent in their most up-to-date ciphers and code machines, which were promptly set up in British code-breaking headquarters. By this time, Pujol's credibility with the Nazis was unquestioned, setting himself in a prime position to serve a critical role in Operation Overlord, aka D-Day. By 1944, British and American forces were planning a long-awaited land invasion of Western Europe on the French shores of Normandy. Operation Overlord was complemented by a sister mission, Operation Fortitude. Those involved with Operation Fortitude were tasked with misdirecting the German High Command into believing that the Allied invasion was planned for Pas du Calais, the geographically closest point of France to England, and unanimously believed by Hitler and the rest of the German High Command to be the most logical entry point of invasion for the British. As such, German troops fortified the beaches of Pas du Calais far more than those at the actual invasion point of Normandy. Allied personnel involved in Operation Fortitude worked to confirm the German suspicions by deploying fake airfields, decoy ships, and armies of inflatable tanks across southeastern England. On the morning of June 6, 1944, Allied troops began to invade the beaches of Normandy. Three days after the invasion, Hitler directed that the majority of Germany's deadly panzer divisions move to Normandy to defend it, which would have been disastrous for the Allied forces struggling to establish a beachhead. Garbo intervened with an urgent message. In it, he persuaded the German High Command that the Normandy attack was merely a diversion, claiming that the true invasion would still occur at Pas du Calais. Garbo's persuasion was successful, and the forces returned to Pas du Calais. Through the following months, two armored divisions, 19 infantry divisions, and one of Germany's top generals, Erwin Rommel, that could have turned the tide of the war in Germany's favor, remained in Pas du Calais, fortifying in preparation for an invasion that would never come. Juan Puchol Garcia's contributions to the Allied war effort were clear. He successfully kept German troops tied up at Pas du Calais long enough for the Allies to send more troops and supplies into France during Operation Overlord. This invasion was key to the Allied victory in World War II. On the British side, Pujol is awarded one of the most excellent order of the British Empire, the highest military order one can receive in Britain. Meanwhile, for the Germans, D-Day only served to strengthen their faith in Pujol, awarding him the Iron Cross for his outstanding contributions to the war effort. This made Pujol the only man in World War II to receive high honors from both sides of the war and solidified him as one of the most prominent double agents in history. Furthermore, a post-war examination of German records revealed that Pujol supplied no fewer than 62 intelligence summaries to the German High Command during this period. In addition, the Germans paid him $1 million by today's standards to support his network of 27 fictitious agents. After the war, Pujol faked his death and moved to Venezuela with his family, where he lived the rest of his life while writing his memoir. Pujol's role in the Allied war effort certainly contributed towards their victory that formed the world as we know it today. World War II had a profound impact on the world, and its aftermath saw two of the major world powers, the United States and the Soviet Union, approach the task of rebuilding Europe in different ways. The United States, through the Marshall Plan, offered economic aid and assistance to European countries, with the aim of promoting democracy and capitalism. The Marshall Plan helped to spur economic growth and reconstruction in Europe, and the countries that participated in the program saw significant improvements in their standard of living. On the other hand, the Soviet Union saw the rebuilding of Europe as an opportunity to spread communism and strengthen its sphere of influence. The Soviet Union implemented state-run central planning in the countries under its control and nationalized industries, leading to widespread economic hardships. The Soviet Union's approach to rebuilding Europe resulted in the division of the continent into two distinct spheres of influence, with Western Europe aligned with the United States and Eastern Europe aligned with the Soviet Union. The differing approaches to rebuilding Europe by the United States and the Soviet Union laid the foundation for the Cold War, which would dominate international relations for the next several decades. The legacy of the differing approaches to rebuilding Europe after World War II can still be felt today, particularly in the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine can be seen as a continuation of the largest struggle between the West and Russia for influence in Europe. The West, led by the United States, has been providing economic and political support to Ukraine as it moves towards a more democratic and market-oriented society. On the other hand, Russia's attack on the freedom of the people of Ukraine is seen as an attempt to maintain its sphere of influence and prevent Ukraine from moving closer to the West. The war in Ukraine is a reminder that the tensions between the West and Russia that were forged in the aftermath of World War II continue to shape the geopolitical landscape of Europe today.